going to present brief biographic data of Dr. Penninger in order to let him initiate soon. So we can take advantage of this opportunity we have to listen to the magistral conference. Dr. Joseph Martin Penninger was born in Gorton, Austria. He is a world renowned genetist and he held the Canada 150 research chairs in functional genetics. Dr. Penninger is currently the director of the Life Science Institute at the University of British Columbia in Canada. He studied medicine at the University of Innsbruck, Austria. From 1990 to 1994, he worked as postdoctoral fellow at the Ontario Cancer Institute. Thereafter, until 2002, at the Department of Immunology and Medical Biophysics at the University of Toronto. As principal investigator at AMGEN, his independent laboratory contributed to the development of the antibody, the Nosumab, for bone loss and also found the first connection of rank ligand to mammary gland development in pregnancy and breast cancer. In 2002, he moved to Vienna, Austria to start and develop the Institute of Molecular Biotechnology of the Austrian Academy of Science, which has become one of the prime research centers in the world. Dr. Penninger ambitions to recreate this environment at the Life Science Institute to nurture and train the best and brightest young minds at the University of British Columbia Scholars. His major accomplishments include pioneering science into the molecular basis of osteoporosis and breast cancer and demonstrating a critical role for ACE2 at the cellular receptors for SARS coronavirus infections and linking ACE2 to lung failure in such infection. He has published extensively in several multidisciplinary scientific journals with over 65 publications in top journals such as Cells, Nature and Science. Joseph has received numerous awards, including with Weinstein Prize of the Austrian federal government and the Carl Prize for Research, the Ernst Young Prize for Medical Excellence, the Innovator Award of the U.S. Department of Defense and the Austrian Cross of Honor for Science and our First Class. Welcome, Dr. Penninger. It's a pleasure to, to hear you. Yeah, <clears throat> thanks so much for the introduction. Can you see my slides? Does it work? Yes. I think I shared before sending an email. <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> so thanks so much for inviting me and I apology that I cannot be there in person. Uh, I'm actually just, it's, it's a busy time for me and like actually leaving Vancouver again, we discussed this, so I'm moving back to Europe and have to prepare with it. So I wanted to tell you today about our work on ACE2, how we discovered it, what we do with it, and why I believe this is actually important for the understanding of COVID and what we can do in therapeutics against the virus infection. So this is my current place I am. It's the Life Sciences Institute, so I'm the head of the of this institute is actually the largest institute. Can you hear me? I have this uh, echo somewhere. Okay. Uh, so it's the largest institute of life sciences in Canada. So this is Vancouver, the harbor. And if you look carefully, this was my supposed place for my boat, which unfortunately never happened because of, of COVID. Uh, so my, my conflict of interest page and of course all, where all my funding comes from are always very important so you can put this in context why I say things and, and who actually funds our research. So mostly I'm a Canada 150 chair. For 150 years of Canada, they hired around 10 people like me to come to Canada and, and uh, do some research. So I'm a Canada 150 chair in functional genetics. Uh, uh, also a Paul Allen investigator and, and got money from a private foundation. Uh, I always like to start my talk with paintings and 
uh, uh, really liking like paintings and art and and my mentor Eric Kandel actually wrote about this <clears throat> this painting of Oskar Kokoschka. So Kokoschka at his time was it was like Picasso, one of the great painters of the 20th century. And <clears throat> when Kokoschka was a young man, you only paid the painting if you liked it. So if you didn't like it, you gave it back to Kokoschka. And when he painted Auguste Forel, uh, the family gave the painting back. Of course, Kokoschka was very disappointed, not knowing what's going on. It's a grand painting, and why would they give the painting back to me? And then they said, well, he doesn't really look like him. <clears throat> so if you look carefully, you see Kokoschka painted Forel, Forel with one hand hanging down, and actually one eyelid hang, hanging down. So he painted him having a stroke, which he did not have. But around a year later, he had exactly the stroke. So now we would call it transient ischemic attacks, uh, uh, which, which pre-opt, pre preempt, of course, uh, uh, strokes later. But in essence, the artist Kokoschka, through his art, was able to anticipate what might happen in the future. And I think this is what biomedical researchers do uh, at all levels, wherever we work in hospitals and uh, at, the, at the bench uh, doing some field work, uh, to use the technology, and the technologies which have been developed in the last years, to fundamentally understand systems. And if we fundamentally understand systems, uh, normal physiology, how the immune system works, uh, uh, how immunity and immune systems uh, uh, respond to infections, for instance, then we can make much better uh, medicine and, of course, better understand the systems. <clears throat> so, for me, this was always, uh, in particular, this painting uh, a metaphor what good biomedical research should accomplish and uh, do. So, the story for me started actually when I was a young uh, investigator in Toronto <clears throat> and I'm actually a trained immunologist so and we started and we worked on, on uh, inflammatory heart disease, autoimmune myocarditis, we mapped peptides and pathways, uh, we made uh, I think the fourth or fifth knockout mouse in the world so this is where I come from, a T-cell immunology, but since we also had worked in heart and, and heart inflammation, uh, we were curious if we could uh, find it in the good old times using P elements in Drosophila here, beating heart in Drosophila, if we could actually find genes which would regulate heart development in Drosophila embryos. So these embryos, and these are the markers we use, Eve and Tinman, and you see the three cells, then they fuse together and basically form this heart tube in the fly. And then we realized that flies had actually two, uh, two copies of a gene uh, one which was already known in mammals and played a critical role in, in blood pressure regulation, uh, namely angiotensin-converting enzyme ACE. So it turns out Rosophil had actually two copies, a longer copy and a short copy. And, uh, called ACE and Rosophila. And so we showed if flies have two copies of ACE, uh, maybe mammals also have two copies of ACE because of evolutionary considerations. And indeed, my Krakow in my laboratory then cloned uh, the second copy called ACE2, angiotensin converting enzyme number two. So this is a very ancient pathway. So if you look structures, so we were involved in this paper here on, on uh, in structures, you can actually find uh, even ACE and ACE2-like enzymes, which even work to regulate blood pressure in mammals, going all the way back to bacteria. <clears throat> so this system must be hundreds uh, of millions years old to have this structural uh, fold, uh, which we now call ACE2. <clears throat> So I should also acknowledge my group was not the first one to actually publish uh, uh, the sequence of ACE2. So we had the sequence clone already, uh, but I'm a functional geneticist, so we all were interested in, uh, in the function and what ACE2 is actually doing in, in a living animal. 
So also structurally ACE2 is this dimer, so transmembrane protein, the dimeric membrane protein. So this was really our question. So of course uh, in Mexico I need to show a Frida Kahlo painting who I really love. Uh, and the question was really, so, so what is ACE2 actually doing in a the, in the living organism? <clears throat> so we made the first ACE2 knockout mouse. And the mice uh, live normal lives, but when we look in a particular mouse background, ACE2 mutants actually have this impaired heart function. So this is normal echocardiography in a normal mouse, and when we knock out ACE2, there's impaired heart function. Uh, and then the real clue came when we actually knocked out the second copy, which had been known already, so ACE, and then made an ACE2 knockout uh, mouse, so a double mutant animal. So you will notice ACE2 uh, uh, in our slang is minus Y, because we actually mapped it to the X chromosome uh, back then in our paper. So that's why this, this is basically an ACE2 uh, knockout male mouse. And when we knocked out uh, ACE2 on this background, then we saw total rescue of the phenotype. Uh, the same was true if we actually challenge the heart uh, and trigger heart disease, like uh, hypertrophy here in a normal mouse. If we knock out ACE2, the animals uh, develop actually very rapid and very severe uh, heart disease. So basically what we found in the studies, in these early studies now going 20 years ago, is that ACE2 is the negative regulator of the renin angiotensin system. Uh, a simplified uh, ACE makes angiotensin 2, or angiotensin 1. This acts on two G-protein coupled receptors and really regulates some of the most fundamental functions in our body, blood pressure control, heart function. Uh, and this also drives many diseases like hypertension, heart failure, kidney disease, fibrotic diseases. And ACE2 is basically the good guy in the system. So ACE makes NH2, ACE2 gets rid of NH2. And the two enzymes in balance gives us uh, uh, normal blood pressure. So this is also the system if after my lecture you get up, you, don't, uh, uh, you, you actually don't faint because it regulates your blood pressure. What I want, want to point out is that ACE2 is very, it's not a specific Protease, so H2 is actually an octapeptide, so eight, eight amino acids, and ACE2 clips away uh, the last amino acid to make angiotensin 1 to 7, and by doing so, inactivates it. But ACE2 can also, as a, as a, as a, a, a peptido uh, enzyme, uh, inactivate and clip the last amino acids of apelin, which regulates. Uh, blood vessel formation, bradykinin, which regulates liquid blood vessels, uh, and molecules like involved in, in pain perception or neurobiology like neurotensin. <clears throat> so when we started this work, we also realized that ACE2 is heavily expressed in the lung. <clears throat> so, so you can see knockouts don't have it and might have a mice have ACE2 in the lung. So this didn't really make sense uh, back in the days. And then we looked at heart function, uh, sorry, at lung function, lung structure, and nothing was changed. So we thought maybe it has a, a, a role in some disease in the lung. So this is where a former postdoc, now professor in, in uh, Japan, Yumiko Imai, came in. So she developed for many years an intensive care station for mice where we could mechanistically dissect uh, cells and pathways which regulate acute lung injury. So this was probably one of the first really reproducible and standardizable uh, uh, intensive care units in animals. <clears throat> so this was a setup actually Yumiko spent on this many, many years to make it work and then asked the question, what is ACE2 doing? So basically trigger acute lung failure in an ACE2 knockout mouse. And this is what happened. When we knocked out ACE2 and trigger acute lung injury, and a non infectious acute lung injury, then the animal got very severe disease. So, in the top in wild type mice, it's already lung failure, uh, in the bottom, massive inflammation. And when we inject uh, Evans Blue into the belly of the mice, 
the blood vessels become so leaky that basically you even see the color, uh, the Evans blue color coming out in the mouth of the spice. So the totally leaky, severe, acute lung disease. Uh, and then SARS hit the world. So this was around 2003. We worked in Toronto. Uh, and we actually, Toronto was the epicenter here, the CN Tower uh, of the SARS outbreak in the outside of China. <clears throat> Just mind you, at the end, there were around 10,000 people infected with SARS coronavirus, as far as we know. Around the lethality was uh, uh, around 10% of them. So, th so this was. Uh, uh, the global outbreak of the first SARS coronavirus uh, uh, infection when it hit and jumped into humans. So the whole idea, for instance, in COVID, that and after tens of thousands of infections uh, emerging immediately after the virus uh, came and jumped onto humans, that we could control this was a, was a very was a very silly notion because there was no way we could control this because even in this outbreak with, with the virus, which was not infectious, you could you needed to uh, cough at somebody because actually one of my students got sick. So we could really follow the outbreak to the first person who got it. And even this outbreak took from October 2002 to around July 2003 to actually control this. So, uh, and then all of a sudden this paper came out in Nature by Mark Fasan, where people were looking for the potential receptor for uh, the spike uh, of the SARS coronavirus. And Mike came up with uh, ACE2 might be a candidate uh, receptor. However, there were many other candidate receptors in, uh, reported in the literature. Uh, and so the question really was, is ACE2 one of many receptors for the SARS coronavirus? Was it actually the essential receptor for the virus infection? So since we had the only knockout mouse in the world at this time, so we sent our mice to China, to Beijing, they got infected with a particular isolate of SARS-CoV. And in wild-type mice, we could recover infectious virus. There's some pathology. And in the knockout mice, basically, there was no infection and no pathology. So this was the experiment to definitively prove that ACE2 is the essential receptor for the SARS coronavirus in vivo. No ACE2, no infection. The other thing we saw if we actually infected animals is that ACE2 disappeared uh, at the protein level. Uh, in the lung here, for instance, uh, infected wild type mice or in the heart also. So, and of course, this was confirmed by many other studies in the future. So, as soon the virus hits ACE2, it actually leads to internalization and degradation. Internalization of the virus, it takes ACE2 with it into the cells, and in the cell, the virus, of course, does what the virus does, and ACE2 gets degraded. So we came up with this uh, uh, scheme, how this works, which is now in the textbook, so the infectious and non-infectious triggers of lung failure and lung injury, actually also, beside, of course, uh, linking to immunity and, and to many other things. Also turn on the renin angiotensin system. So angiotensin 2 is made. And while the 81 receptor actually drives more severe inflammation, more severe acute lung injury. Now the virus SARS-CoV uses ACE2 for its entry. So no ACE2, no infection. But if spike binds to ACE2, it actually the virus gets into the cell and ACE2 gets downregulated and degraded, which means ACE2 is not available on the surface anymore and cannot degrade angiotensin 2. And therefore, the disease actually gets worse, as we have seen when we knock out ACE2. So we believe the SARS coronavirus became such a dangerous virus because it hit a molecule which protects our lung from more severe injury. So this is not just the bystander receptor the virus uses, but it's the central receptor. And secondly, it actually protects from more severe disease. And that's, we believe, why this virus became actually such a killer virus. So <clears throat> over the years, we then uh, started to develop uh, a soluble, recombinant version of angiotensin II uh, for lung injury and lung failure. 
which of course acute respiratory distress syndrome, ARDS is the end stage uh, lung disease in sepsis and in, in, in Spanish flu, in, in, the, in the bird flu, uh, in bioterrorism, uh, anthrax, for instance. So many also non infectious uh, triggers of lung failure. So we thought if maybe the SARS coronavirus has shown us a medicine, soluble version of ACE2, there's not enough, we bring it back like uh, insulin in a diabetic, and then we can do something and then actually have some partial protection from lung injury. <clears throat> so we were laboring away and, and people you know, said, you know, Joseph, your mechanistic work on SARS coronavirus infection and ACE2 is beautiful, uh, but it's totally irrelevant <clears throat> because who cares anyway? So this is, this is a mechanistic study on something which does not exist anymore. So of course, uh, then SARS coronavirus 2 came into the world, uh, <clears throat> causing this unprecedented uh, pandemic since unprecedented since 100 years, uh, which we call coronavirus disease 2019, COVID 19. So, this is actually a bad, uh, <clears throat> a bad embryos. So, very rapidly, based on the, on the sequence and, and also cryo EM structures. It became clear that SARS coronavirus 2 spike can also bind to ACE2. Uh, so, all of a sudden, all the work we have been doing uh, many, many years ago became the center stage of the pandemic. Uh, so, this is basically how it looks. Uh, again, <clears throat> and this is ACE2, a dimeric molecule, and this is spike, of course, which is trimeric and this binds to ACE2. So, <clears throat> Since we had actually developed a recombinant version of ACE2 for clinical treatment, and it had been already in 80 patients in phase one and phase two clinical trials. So we were wondering if ACE2 is really important, then we could actually use it as a molecular decoy to block the infection. And to remind you again, this is the idea, the SARS coronavirus one and two, uh, via spike bind to ACE2. This leads to internalization, either membrane fusion or endocytosis. And in the cell, of course, the virus does what the virus does. It uh, replicates itself, it corrupts the protein machinery, immunity, and adaptive and innate immune systems are turned on, leading eventually to diseases we call SARS and COVID-19, of course, with shading and variations of severity. This was the idea to use a soluble uh, molecular decoy, a soluble ACE2, because if you basically soak the virus with uh, the soluble version of ACE2, it would soak up all spike, which cannot find its membrane bound version of ACE2 anymore, uh, resulting in less viral internalization and, of course, improved disease. <laughs> So mind you, this principle is the principle of basically every vaccination against SARS coronavirus 2. Where we entice or the immune system, whatever the vaccine is, uh, viral based or protein based or RNA based, where basically the immune system is enticed to make antibodies to block the interaction between spike and ACE2. And by doing so, uh, alleviates, uh, prevents the infection and of course uh, protects from COVID-19. So also basically all, at least initially, now the protease inhibitors also, drugs uh, which were approved for treatment of, co of COVID-19 had all worked on the same principle, to block ACE2 binding to, so to block spike binding to ACE2. So we know this principle is basically valid in 14 billion vaccinations in this world. Uh, to do the studies initially, uh, we actually hooked up with the group in Karolinska. This is how the virus looks. So this was actually the first uh, SARS-CoV-2 patient in, in uh, Sweden. So this is how the virus looks. That's why it's called coronavirus because it has like a crown-like structure. Uh, we cloned the virus and then we infected uh, uh, particular cells, very sick cells, and then uh, treated them uh, with human recombinant ACE2. Molecular decoy binds to virus and it should block the infection. 
And this is exactly as it happens in a dose dependent manner, as, as you would expect uh, uh, something, you know, blocking the, the virus to bind to its real receptor. Uh, the other thing we were really curious in was we, we knew from many of our studies, uh, uh, for instance, in this paper in Nature, that ACE2, where we mapped ACE2 to the, to the epithelial luminal surface of the, of the intestine, or in this paper where we mapped uh, ACE2 to proximal uh, tubular cells in the kidney, that ACE2 is actually not just lung restricted, and I showed you the phenotype in the, in the heart. So it's in the heart, it's in the blood vessels, it's in the nose epithelium, it's on the tongue, it's in some central nervous system cells. So there's huge literature of ACE2 function in various systems, as you would as expect from being a regulator of the rain and angiotensin system. So we also mapped, and of course people, many other people showed this, that ACE2 expression changes with age, with gender, with metabolic input, with hypertension. We mapped it on the X chromosomes or the sex uh, gender differences. And of course it changes with smoking and diabetes because of course there's a metabolic conditions which change the rain and angiotensin system and thereby uh, the regulatory pathways of it. <clears throat> so we were wondering if this is real, because initially COVID-19 was just a respiratory disease, just uh, the wrong word was it, defined as a respiratory disease, and whatever happens in the body is just secondary. But we knew it's expressed. And so we wanted to prove that ACE2 expression on, on non-respiratory cells is also important for virus infection, because this, of course, would totally change how we see infection and how we actually understand pathogenesis of COVID-19. So to do this, we actually uh, started tissue engineering with Nuria Montserrat in Barcelona. So these are little kidneys uh, generated from uh, human stem cells. Uh, in single cell sequencing, you see we get actually many different types of kidney cells. And exactly where you would see ACE2 in human or mouse kidney and the proximal tubule cells, we also see ACE2 expression in this human engineered, stem cell engineered little kidneys. So we took these little kidneys, infected them with the coronavirus. We can indeed infect them. Of course, if they have the receptor, you can infect them. And again, soluble ACE2 as a molecular decoy reduces the infection. We did the same with engineered human blood vessels. Uh, some years ago, we made the first blood vessels uh, from stem cells, with, which are perfect capillaries with endothelium, pericyte, lumen, basal membranes. Uh, again, the virus can infect the cells, and we can also get viral progeny. So it's not just infection, but inside the cells, a new virus is produced, which can infect the next cell. And again, a hu human recombinant a uh, soluble ACE2 as a molecular decoy can reduce infection. So, so now we know, and of course from many, many thousands of studies, uh, we know, uh, you know the virus lands, if I would cough on you on the nose, on, on the throat, uh, or epithelial cells, which has ACE2. Uh, in, some people this might do nothing, so they are symptomatic, or some people might get the runny nose, and that's it. However, if the, if the virus gets uh, access deep into the lung, this is where ACE2 is, and, and in alveolar type 2 cells, so, and this then triggers a very, very severe pneumonia, which is very different from the flu pneumonia, because the different regions of the lung which are infected. So that's why there is a, is a flu cough and a COVID cough, so you can actually hear uh, a COVID cough, which makes sense because of the regions where the virus hits by these two and basically triggers this inflammation. Uh, if the virus now spreads out and gets out of the lung because of inflammation, of course, inflammatory cells float in and, and many other things happen, coagulation changes, then of course the virus uh, can get to secondary tissues, which also express ACE, like the lung, for instance. So the lung, uh, other lung cells, uh, uh, the heart, the brain, uh, the nose, the liver, 
kidney, the, the intestine, and, and so by doing so, spread directly into other tissues. And of course, now it has been shown that this is indeed happening, and the virus, like in the gut, for instance, can even linger for many, many months. So, if I would now take a recombinant ACE2 and inject it into you, so this is what would happen. So your level of angiotensin 2, your baseline level of angiotensin 2 in our in your in your blood would very rapidly within minutes basically be diminished to nearly nothing. Uh, and the peptide angiotensin 1 to 7 is being produced from this octa peptide. So now you have seven amino acids from eight because the last amino acid is cleaved off by ACE2. Now, angiotensin 2 is known to drive vasoconstriction, blood pressure, uh, vascular remodeling, uh, hypertrophy in the heart, uh, uh, water <coughs> retention is pro-inflammatory, drives inflammation. So if I actually inject angiotensin uh, 2 into an animal or a human, they, they massively induce interleukin-6, for instance. So angiotensin 1 to 7, the product of ACE2 actually does the opposite. It opens the blood vessel, protects the heart, it, it's against inflammation. So ACE2 is really beneficial in multiple tissues and multiple settings. So I mention this because uh, the, you know, in Canada, for instance, it's estimated that 15% of the people who had COVID actually develop long-term symptoms. And there's you know, some of the symptoms of, of long COVID are, of course, badly defined, but some others like, like cardiovascular outcomes, cardiovascular uh, changes are also quite frequent. And of course, the question really is, uh, what's the cause of long COVID? And I think we really don't understand this yet. There's autoimmunity, of course, deregulation of, of uh, clotting factors. But uh, the group, for instance, has shown this a spike permanently produced still in the bodies. And of course, if you have spike, you could get also chronic deregulation of ACE2. <clears throat> because as soon as spike binds to ACE2, it changes surface expression and you would change the local environment. And I showed you all the impacts it could have in multiple tissues. So we are working now on the an assumption that ACE2 and deregulation of ACE2 uh, might also drive long COVID. We have no data yet, but this is at least one assumption which is testable. So now we live in this world where we have the structure, we know uh, the virus binds to ACE2, and, and, and in a world where, which has amazingly responded making vaccines. Uh, with nanoparticles, RNA-based vaccines. So I think this is a real testament to the power of science and research. Uh, for instance, here actually, my neighbor here in Vancouver is uh, Peter Kallis, so he actually developed the nanoparticles which are used in billions of people for vaccination. So he's literally the father of, of uh, LMPs. For many years, nobody really cared. I think he published his first paper in 75. So, so we need basic research, and you never know where this can lead us. So, but it's a real testament how, how you know, science has responded to the greater good. But of course also, in which was expected, uh, virus variants emerged because there's evolutionary pressure. Many people were infected, uh, were vaccinated, get uh, antibody cocktails. There's evolutionary pressure of the virus to escape, uh, of course, uh, with this evolutionary pressure of our immune system. So and this, of course, happened. So many variants of concerns, variants of interest emerged, as they do still uh, at the moment. So the question then is, can we develop the universal pan SARS-CoV-2 therapy, which works against every variant? Because we know the antibodies, which were made by many companies, uh, they work, but then they stop working because the virus escape. Same for vaccines, they work, but for Omicron, for instance, uh, many cases the vaccines didn't work anymore because the, the virus learned to escape the immune system. So could we, based on the, what we know from the virus and virus entry, actually define a therapy and, de and develop a therapy which always works against every variant, 
which we know now and every variant which might occur in 10 years. And actually the solution is right in, our in front of us and the solution is actually ACE2. So this is ACE2, this is the virus, because the virus uses ACE2 uh, for entry. And nobody has ever found a virus variant which does not bind to ACE2. So obviously, you know, if you have a door uh, to get into the room, like in the lecture room, and uh, and you and, and you need this door because if the door is not there anymore, then you cannot get in anymore. <clears throat> so and of course there might be many variations how you open the door, but you still need to get through this door. So. <clears throat> So we wanted to test this if this is real. You know, it's a nice concept, but this is real. So we uh, did studies in Delta, Beta, Alpha, uh, SARS coronavirus 2 variants. And indeed, uh, recombinant ACE2, we call it APN01. So that's actually a molecule which went to the clinic, uh, still blocks it. So this was our initial study in cell. So the first viral isolate in the Wuhan virus. Uh, so we needed around 25 microgram, which is quite a lot of protein of ACE2 to block around 50% of the infection in this particular cell model. However, for Delta, Beta and Alpha, uh, the actual spike has emerged, which is high affinity for ACE2. And even at much lower doses, uh, we see nearly 100% protection from infection. So it indeed works. Uh, also want to point out this actually uh, levels of affinity, which is like a high affinity antibody. So ACE2 is not just this little touching the virus, it's actually very high affinity detection. So how about Omicron, which then became dominant? And the same is happening uh, with human recombinant ACE2. We can nearly, even at very low dose, nearly completely block uh, the infection. Uh, also want to point out mouse ACE2 uh, also works now. So you know ACE2 has this uh, infects many, sorry, uh, SARS-CoV-2 can infect many species, humans, lions, uh, deer, cats, uh, dogs, uh, hamsters, but it could not infect a species like rodents, uh, mouse and rat. However, Omicron can do this. And that's why actually mouse recombinant ACE2 also works. Not as good as the human version, but it actually Omicron gained uh, affinity for mouse ACE2. So, so Omicron basically jumped into all the populations. <clears throat> so one thing I wanted to point out because I find it, find it quite fascinating is uh, ACE2 is heavily glycosylated. Is, is spike. So this is, you know, the, the protein backbone we always see is actually not real. And so we were curious if we could read all of this out, uh, if we could actually see the glycoprotein, so basically the coverage of the exact uh, sugar trees on ACE2 and also on spike. So we did this. <coughs> this is how it looks, for instance. So this is ACE2 here on the top and this in, in pink, uh, all this particular sugar trees uh, and we mapped the, the sites, exact sites uh, where this is happening. Basically, the site on ACE2, which carries particular sugar trees and sites on, on spike, which carries particular sugar trees. So spike has 22 end glycosylation sites. So these are the sites we mapped and then other groups mapped. Uh, and these are the complex sugar trees which are sitting on the sites. And I'm always impressed about this image because this is the protein backbone of Spike, as we know it from the newspapers and all the media. And this is actually how Spike really looks, covered in glycans. So it's a totally different structure. And so you can imagine just uh, small changes in, in some of the amino acids might really change the structure of the whole Spike protein. So it's covered in sugar, basically a tree uh, with, with leaves all over the place. <clears throat> so this is, and this is a highly dynamic structure. So if you do actually 3D modeling and dynamic modeling, you actually see this, this sugar trees actually flipping all over the place. 
So to, to study this a little further, we, we cloned uh, probably the largest lectin library in the world. So lectins are proteins which in evolution uh, have gained the potential to bind to, to particular sugar trees, um, to so basically sugar binding proteins. So we cloned 140 lectins. We are doing this now actually with, with the human lectin libraries and we have cloned now 120 of them. Basically express them as lectibodies. Uh, lectins used to have C fusion, so we can use them in ELISAs. And of course, uh, screen binding to particular proteins. <laughs> Uh, this is one of the bindings, so I, I always like this because it's a dance. This is actually a watching spike, <coughs> which is trimeric, a single spike binding to single uh, lectin. So this is a single, um, single protein imaging using atomic force microscopy, and you see the dynamics, how fast the lectin comes to spike and disappears. And of course, this allows us to measure affinities, binding constants, and so on. Uh, and when we do this, we actually found two critical uh, lectins <coughs> which can bind to spike. One is called CD209, and this is the binding site here, and the other one is CLEC 4G. <coughs> and I'll show you a little more in detail. And indeed, both of them, uh, if we block with the lectin CLEC 4G and also CD209, we can in part block the virus infection. And so this is basically the summary of, of three years of work on this. So this is spike uh, in green is the uh, protein backbone here in yellow are actually the sugars coming out. And here in uh, red is actually critical uh, uh, sugar, very complex sugar tree on the site uh, 343 of the receptor binding domain of spike which touches ACE2, and this is ACE2, dimeric ACE2, also covered with sugar. And this site is really important because it actually touches ACE2, and if you can block it, then you can also interfere with the infection, as you would expect, because the sugar is standing out, and you can actually block this uh, with selectin or some antibodies or other molecules. So this is the reason why when people dump in a lot of you know, unspecific sugars or sugar binding protein into the reactions of, of uh, SARS-CoV-2 binding to ACE2 and then make all these uh, claims of new receptors and you name it. <coughs> that, but the reason is because you, you basically soak up the sugars by doing so blocked infection. These are very low affinity uh, interactions. So you need thousand times more lectin uh, as compared to solid ACE2 to, to block the infection. Because ACE2 binding is very high affinity, like an antibody. A lectin binding, a very, very low affinity binding because of the structures and, and movement of the sugars. So, so this, of course, begs the question. Is ACE2 actually the critical receptor for SARS coronavirus 2? There were many papers out there. And, nature and cell and science where people claim different receptors are important they are and they might be important uh, so but and, but it's a really important question because if you make antibodies to block the interaction with ACE2 or vaccines uh, maybe this is not enough because maybe there's a other critical receptor which we're missing and this is what needs to be blocked so I think this was actually one of the key questions in the entire field is ACE2 the real receptor so at the essential receptor, of course, there are other receptors which can bind. I showed you some of the lectins, but what's real essential for the infection? <laughs> so this is actually not so easy to address, and eventually we could address it working with Sylvia Knapp at the Medical University in Vienna. And her uh, group actually made, uh, engineered a mouse-adapted SARS coronavirus which we called a mouse adapted Vienna 16 because basically bulb C mice were infected and 16 passages were made to select a more and more and more infectious virus. Adapt the SARS coronavirus to mouse. <clears throat> and eventually uh, uh, Sylvia got the virus which is really pathogenic. <clears throat> so this virus triggers severe lung disease uh, it can infect cells here with uh, AP staining and here again. So, so she selected out a, a, a virus which 
Kenkos Maestro 3, etwa High Vibers Dose, and the triggers very severe acute lung injury. So when you actually look at the sequences from every, every passage, <clears throat> uh, at the end, this virus acquired actually three mutations, which now allow the spike of SARS-CoV-2 to bind to mouse ACE2 much better. And this is the reason the explanation why I can infect mice. Omicron has two of these mutations, but two, two, two changes which explains why Omicron can also infect rodents. <clears throat> So now we had the system. So we infected an ACE2 knockout mouse and a white type mouse. And so now we can ask the question, is ACE2 essential or not? Because if it's not essential, we will still get an infection and disease. And the bottom line was when we knock out ACE2, there's no change in body weight, there's no change in body temperature, and there's zero infection. So here's infection, there's MP staining in the normal mouse, in an ACE2 knockout mouse, no infection. So, so this, Experiment showed no ACE2, no respiratory SARS coronavirus infection. So ACE2 is indeed uh, essential. <clears throat> so is this the same true for human? After all, this is a mouse. So to do this, we did again a stem cell engineering, <clears throat> uh, made little human kidneys, where we knocked out ACE2, where well, ACE2 was wild type, <clears throat> then they were infected with SARS coronavirus 2, and you can see here in pink. Uh, NP staining, so the virus can infect the human tissue, the little human uh, kidneys, and when we knock out ACE2, zero infection. So these organoids still have all the other candidate receptor people have published in other papers, so obviously they, they might modify the infection, but without ACE2 there is no infection, so ACE2 is essential. <clears throat> So how about uh, comorbidities? You know, people with diabetes and hypertension and obesity get more severe disease. Maybe under certain, com under these conditions, another receptor emerges and therefore <clears throat> you don't need any more ACE2 <clears throat> for doing this. <clears throat> so to do this, uh, we developed this Nuria uh, and basically we engineered human uh, little kidneys, uh, kidney organoids, and then expose them to changes in glucose. So basically created a diabetic uh, human kidney. And we had lots of uh, studies to show the, the, the glycolytic milieu changes and there's real changes as you would see in the patient. So the bottom line is what you see is high glucose actually induces more ACE2. <clears throat> And because there's more ACE2, there's more infection, which I don't show you, but here in this diabetic organoids in red, you see NP, nuclear protein, immunostaining showing the infection. So when we do the same <clears throat> and make a diabetic kidney, human kidney organoid, and knock out ACE2, zero infection. So it does work, even under conditions of comorbidity, ACE2 is essential. Uh, so now to my last uh, two, three slides. Uh, can we actually use these animal models now to set up therapeutics? And of course, other people have been doing this with their mouse adapted SARS coronavirus, uh, uh, humanized ACE2 mice, uh, transgenic ACE2 mice. So we have this model where basically have a natural infection and can then ask the question if you do a respiratory infection, could you actually? Uh, use uh, inhaled ACE2 decoys to block the infection. Because one thing we have learned during the COVID-19 pandemic, if one treats too late, <clears throat> it's very difficult to have any impact. Because many organ systems, many systems like the immune system, uh, coagulation, uh, 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 or organ functions, uh, 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 affected. So therefore a single treatment is nearly impossible. And the other thing we learned, you have to treat as early as possible. So if you treat early with remdesivir, it does work. If you treat later, it doesn't work. The same for antibody. So for a real prevention and an early treatment strategy, you have to go as early as possible. But of course, if you go early as possible, you need a treatment which is feasible. And in and you know to do an IV infusion or even intramuscular injection is not feasible. But to have inhalation of proteins or molecules, 
that's at least in part feasible. So we asked the question, can we make inhalable ACE2 and how does this affect infection? So these are the data. So these are uh, animals, pulpsy mice, and they were infected. Then we give them in these different time points, intranasal recombinant uh, ACE2 or just uh, vehicle, and these are the data. So in, in, if without in, in, in basically control treatments that get uh, diseased, and eventually die in the bulk C background, so severe lung uh, uh, injury. And then we give a recombinant ACE2, we see total protection from the disease. So the question then was, you know, does this, is this a timing? So we started treating uh, up, uh, half a day after infection, one day after infection, two days after infection, and we would expect and, and you see exactly what you expect. The earlier you start treatment, the more protection you have. The later you start treatment, you still have protection. For instance, here, after a 24 hour first infection, after 24 hours you start treatment, or here 48 hours you start treatment, but the protection is much less than you start treatment earlier, exactly as one would expect and as the system works. Um, this is actually a group, another group, uh, which use different models uh, to see if it also works there. And uh, here, this normal lung, these are uh, uh, lungs of animals, these are 18 humanized ACE2 mice infected with SARS CoV 2, severe infection and disease. And when they give them nebulized, they uh, inhaled uh, recombinant ACE2, <coughs> there's protection from disease. Uh, and with this, I stop. Uh, and with the message, and I hope I could convince you that ACE2, which we initially found in a, in a fly screen for heart development, then mapped as a key regulator of the renin angiotensin system in multiple tissues, always protecting, protecting the lung from more severe disease, or the heart from more severe disease, protecting from hypertension. And then SARS coronavirus, one and two, and probably 20 other SARS coronaviruses which have the potential to jump onto human in the future, have co-opted the system, this very ancient, evolutionary ancient system to jump onto humans, <clears throat> to give respiratory infections, uh, and also in uh, all probably longer effects and infection of other tissues. If this might be one of the reasons for long COVID or not, still needs to be determined. But this, of course, is also the weak side of the virus. It's the essential receptor, and I hope I could convince you in animal studies and human studies that no ACE2 results in, in basically total protection from the SARS coronavirus infection. So since this is the weak spot, we could actually develop, and this is what we're trying to do, a, a therapeutic strategy to prevent and treat all infections, because the earlier treat the better, all infections with all variants we know and might occur in the future of SARS coronavirus 2. This is a soluble decoy version of ACE2. So we uh, published this recently and, and summed up this in the review in cell. So if you're interested to read up why we believe this is happening and what's also the literature uh, leading uh, to this conclusion. And with this, uh, thank you so much for having me and, and allowing me to tell you our ACE2 story from the start to the treatment and understanding of vaccines and, can, and infection with SARS coronavirus 2, and of course, a fundamental understanding of COVID 19. So there were many people involved from my cacao clone days to in my lab. Yumiko developed the first uh, intensive care unit where we could study the function of ACE2 in, in lung. Uh, <clears throat> Nuria and, and Ali and Vanessa, where we have this team of SARS CoV 2 infection and human tissue <clears throat> engineering uh, clinicians who always keep us honest and tell us what's, what's really happening in real patients. And many other people like Sylvia who developed the mouse adapted SARS coronavirus. And this is a stop. So these are my groups in Europe and Canada. <coughs> uh, as you can see in Europe, we like to go to the pub and drink good wine. In Canada, they all go hiking. So, and they drink wine in the evening. So with this, uh, thank you so much. And uh, 
please uh, ask me something.